Next goal wins is one of the most exciting scenarios in all of sports. When Major League Quidditch added its new endgame rules at the beginning of the past season, such situations were their dreams. For it to happen in a championship match could not have gone better. And then, before the hype even had time to build, it was over. Teddy Costa took a yellow card for an illegal charge, and the door to victory for Austin was jarred wide open. A foolish play by Clay commentator even had the audacity to claim... And that might just be the game right there, that play. And then it wasn't. Over the next minute, Boston would secure a defensive stop, kill the power play, and find the match-winning goal. How'd they do it? Let's break it down. Out of the stoppage with a minute's worth of penalty time, Austin took a moment to set up its offense and assess the situation. The Outlaws found themselves up a Quaffle player, but down a Bludger. In a power play situation like the one Austin finds itself in, it's important to maximize your advantages while minimizing the effects of your disadvantages. Unfortunately for Austin, this runs contrary to the ideals of Cavball, the offensive system they had relied on all season long. Because Cavball requires three offensive Quaffle players at the top of the zone, the defense becomes far too easy. Grace Das 2, as a chaser, loosely guards one wing while also being available as an ad body in the lane, while Leanne Dillman can shade to the side of the only offensive chaser in the keeper zone, which is Marty Bermudez here. The Outlaws begin the possession with a tap beat on the Boston Point defender Brian Mulcahy in an attempt to start forcing defensive shifts that would leave the Knight Riders vulnerable. If Grace Das 2 starts to step in as a switch to the point, it would leave Josh Andrews on the white wing for an unmarked, dangerous, and incisive cut. Unfortunately for Austin, the tap beat bounces away from Cole Travis, rendering the team without their budget for a few seconds. This would not have mattered if Das had still made the shift, but the disciplined Boston defense doesn't make that mistake. Instead, Mario Nasta, no longer threatened, takes a simple two steps up, keeping Augie Monroe out of the driving lane long enough for Mulcahy to touch his hoops and return to his spot. As Mulcahy returns, Travis fetches his bludger and manages to trade beats with Nasta, knocking both bludgers and both beaters out of the play. Kylie McBride is not able to recover the Austin bludger immediately, and when she does, she chooses to bring it back into the Outlaws defensive half, giving Dillman free reign on her half of the field. But perhaps more important as we go back, then the choices made by the beaters is the choice made here by Augustine Monroe. As Travis and Nasta exchange beats, he chooses to drive to his left, where both of his unmarked chasers, as well as Dillman, already are. The lane he chooses to use here renders Casey Irwin completely unavailable as a passing option, while pulling Dillman even closer to Bermudez, which is his only other option. Dillman, who does not see Mulcahy coming back into the play behind her, but knowing that Master should have a ball at the hoops pretty soon, and that the only thing that must be stopped here is a Monroe drive, chooses to step hard on Monroe, forcing him into his only passing option, Bermudez. But Archibald crashes to Bermudez hard, and by now, Nasta has recovered his budger near the hoops, with Das2 shifting the hoops to cover any potential shots as well. The last opportunity for the possession is a backdoor cut by Andrews into this open space left by the defensive shifts of Boston. But as he begins to make this cut, Monroe sees the same idea and takes it himself, right here. But from a far less dangerous angle, and with Mulcahy blanketing him. Andrews feels compelled to break out of his attempted cut, and Bermudez chooses to simply reset the offense. In their second attempt at scoring on the power play, Austin chooses for a more aggressive box formation, placing a pair of unmarked chasers on both sides of the keeper zone to actually force Boston into more difficult defensive positions, with Casey Irwin and Marty Bermudez eventually going to find themselves on opposite sides here. Cole Travis takes the bludger and once again opens the play with a tap beat on Mulcahy, but this time chooses to charge Nasta rather than gather his bludger and take the exchange like he did the first time. This is a higher risk play, as it is of course easier to take a, bludger, a beater out of the play with a bludger than it is to take them out of play with a tackle, but it's also more timely and will prevent Mulcahy from having time to tag back into the play as he's being beat here, allowing Monroe to take a more aggressive drive. Now, Nasta doesn't have many options as he doesn't have a teammate to defend him from this charge. He can choose to just beat Travis out of the play, but it's likely that due to Travis's momentum, a, bl a bludger beat will go flying off pitch 
and leave Nasta without a bludger even if Travis is no longer a threat. His only other option is to use Travis's momentum against him. Because he's traveling so aggressively in one direction, if Nasta is able to sidestep him, it'll be difficult for Travis at the last second to change the, d the directionality of his momentum and successfully make this hit. As you see, Nasta waits to the last second, fakes a beat which forces Travis's arms in the air and off of his broom, reducing his ability to move side to side even more, and Nasta will simply sidestep out of the play here. When Nasta sidesteps Travis's charge, it forces Monroe to pass the ball rather than continuing his drive. Nasta, now out of position, takes the only option he has left, which is to tap beat Monroe so that he's at least not in the play. Though this is a tap beat that, as you'll see, Monroe chooses to ignore. It is now up to the rest of the defense to step up in Nasta's uh, absence. The last thing that I wanted to touch on here in the beater game is that Nasta is able to keep Ludger control at the end of this play due to a mistake by McBride. As you see, this initial tap beat from Travis goes right to McBride. If she picks up this ball right at this moment and chooses to attack Nasta as he's making this tap beat and this dodge, there's a good chance that the Austin beater pair walks away with Butcher control that would have meant a lot on the next defensive possession. But she misses this scoop and has to chase it down out of the play, doesn't get to the ball until it's almost at midfield and ends up staying out of the play. This allows Nasta, even after his tap beat, to clean up his bludger and keep bludger control. Regardless, Austin has now successfully gotten the opportunity they wanted, as Bermudez receives the ball in stride, cutting to the hoops. With no other defensive options, Archibald and Dillman are forced to both step out onto him. If only Archibald steps out, there's a good chance that Bermudez is able to just get by him, as Archibald's not known for his physicality, and then uncork a mid-range shot for a goal. If only Dillman steps out, Bermudez will be able to step as close as he can to the hoops before Dillman gets to him and cork a shot into whatever hoop Archibald isn't defending, especially with these MLQ extra spread hoops. Dillman chooses to throw early and gets incredibly unlucky as the ball careens off of Archibald's outstretched defensive arm, which hypothetically creates a no budger situation for at least two to three seconds as Nasta hustles back into the play from the tap beat he just made. But lucky for Boston, Bermudez had already committed to another play that he thought would be foolproof. As we go back for a second here and once again look at Bermudez's cut, we'll see what he's seeing as he gets the ball. Of course Nasta is out of the play and he knows that Dillman is collapsing on him. He also knows that Archibald has come out to him as well and that Dastu has stayed in the back with Josh Andrews. Because of that, he knows that there is nobody that could possibly be covering Casey Irwin. So as Dillman's bludger hurdles towards him, he makes the decision to uncork what should be the game-winning pass. And it would have been, if not for an incredibly aware play from Mulcahy. If we follow Mulcahy from the beginning of this play when he is beat, he's gaining awareness every step of the way. You can see his eyes picking up where Bermudez is in the play, and he's soon going to turn to find where Irwin is in the play as well. As he sees Archibald step out, he knows the only angle available to Bermudez in terms of scoring is one towards the far hoop over here. He also knows that there's no possible passing options from the side he just came from because he saw what happened to the players in that play. With that in mind, he tags up and immediately cuts off all angles to the far hoop right here. This forces Irwin to check her cut short of a dangerous position and she instead receives the pass parallel to the hoops with no chance to score. But Mulcahy isn't done yet. Knowing that there still might be an open passing option, he aggressively pursues Irwin, who does one of her trademark retreats out of the zone by foot. She finally makes an attempt to juke Mulcahy, but does so having lost track of her positioning, taking a step out of bounds and turning the ball over to Boston. As Mulcahy inbounds the ball rather poorly to Archibald, Costa comes out of the penalty box, having served his time. Now, Boston has bludger control and their full offense and are ready to strike for the game-winning goal. For this possession, Boston's top line goes to one of its favorite sets with bludger control, having one beater accompany Archibald up the one side and one accompanying Costa up the other. This serves two purposes for the offense. The first is to force the opposing beaters into impossible decisions. If the defensive beater with a bludger stays too centralized, the beater accompanying Archibald can usher one of the best shooters in the sport closer and closer to the hoops. If that beater instead chooses to step out to Archibald, a simple pass across to Costa 
allows him to attack a bludgerless side of the field with an armed beater alongside him. And the second thing the set does is guarantee Costa can always be hit with a pass. As you can see in this play, Monroe of course has the athleticism to play Costa tight in a man-to-man -man defense, but cannot because Dillman is between the two of them. If he tried to step out, it would be a simple tap beat. With McBride remaining sec centralized with a bludger, Travis is still able to do enough without one to bother Nasta and force Archibald to look elsewhere for this offense. Sure enough, Archibald zips the pass over to Costa and Dillman simultaneously beats Monroe. It is now the Austin defense's turn to make the proper rotations as Costa receives a pass unmarked in stride at the edge of the keeper zone. The most important pair of decisions need to be made by Andrews, the keeper here, and McBride, the beater with the bludger. With Archibald behind the play and Mulcahy locked down by Irwin behind the hoops, the two of them need to be preventing two threats, a shot by Costa and a pass the unmarked ass to, who's currently just ever so slightly off screen on the left side here. However, one thing that needs to be accounted for is that at the angle Costa is, outside the width of the hoops, his shooting options are realistically limited. He might have an angle to shoot at this far hoop here, but even that might be from a difficult angle and thus a low percentage. Unfortunately for Austin in this case, both McBride and Andrews take the most aggressive possible line to shut down Costa's shot. McBride throws a long beat that may not have been a threat to hit anyway, while Andrews crashes the far hoop hard. To add insult to injury, even Irwin steps off of her player to crash to that far hoop. Everybody takes, tries to take away the shot at the same time, and it's in part due to the smart play of Dastu, who waits until the very, very last second to make her cut, allowing the Austin defense to make all the wrong calculations about what the biggest threat here was. Costa reads the play all the way through and corks a pristine pass to Dastu, who has nobody within two hoops length of her. She finishes the shot and the match. Here we watched a pair of possessions that were all about defensive rotations and maximizing the mistakes that they make. Boston was able to do it so effectively on their offensive possession, while Austin was not able to do the same when attacking even against a power play. That decided game one of the MLQ finals and eventually the title. Thank you for watching. And take care.